Well, yeah, Dave, you didn't have to play last week because of the buy. I don't know you needed to buy, but it had you had to play, how long did it calculate you guys to get back to the East Coast swing of things? Would have been really difficult to make that transition. Yeah, it would have been challenging. I mean, we played the 12-30 game in California, uh, as you know. And uh, with that being said, still didn't get back to Raleigh to almost 4 a.m. And um, so, you know, it would have been hard to have anything on a Sunday with the guys. It was 4 a.m. Sunday when we landed. And uh, so guys aren't in bed until 4.30 in the morning. So it would have changed our weekly routine. Obviously, there would have been a sleep deficit that you'd be concerned with and, you know, six – five and a half to six hours of sitting on a plane after playing a football game, coaching a football game, you could feel it, you know, in your legs. And and for these guys, I think this is their fourth time going to the East coast for Stanford, you know? And so it's, it's a lot. Uh, travel is real. You can feel it. And for us going out there on a Thursday made a difference. Uh, I can tell you that, you know, changing our routine from a travel standpoint, but I am thankful we have a buy on the back end of this, um, particularly with it being our eighth straight game. It would have been really hard playing nine in a row coming off of that one. Jaden? Dave, obviously, Grayson McCall, you know, announced his medical retirement last week. Um, just how did those conversations go when he, he talked to you about that? Um, you know, I asked him how he wanted to go about, you know, the next stage, and he needed time, and I said, you do whatever you need to do we're here to support you and um that's really it you know i'm like when you're ready to announce the next steps let's have a conversation and we knew where this thing was going and you know i wanted him to do it his way he's earned every opportunity in the sport he's a great teammate he's a, a tremendous young guy to coach and he's got a bright future um as a coach if that's what he chooses to do but as a leader for sure um and it was pretty simple you know, hey, do what you need. What do you need from us? How can we help in the process? And speaking with him and his family, you know, when do you need time? And he needed time with his family during the bye week, which we totally got. And I was happy for him that he's able to do it his way. I know that was a tough week, um, as it is for any player. But, you know, when it ends without it being your choice, when basically God is telling you it's time to stop, uh, and he is a spiritual young, young man. And so being able to lean into his path that way and, and trust in the Lord, I think, was a big part of this for him. Brian? Yeah, Dave, just, just to follow up on that, when, when did he tell you? Was it was it way ahead of time? Did you know for a while? And then did he address the team at all? How did he, how did he let his teammates know? No, he. I mean, he's done it all on his own time. Um we kind of knew after the game, I mean, if he had another one, that that was probably it, you know, and, and it was pretty quick. It was more of a matter of the steps he wanted to take and when he was ready to, to make it a public thing, you know, and it's a big step, you know, to make that announcement and, and have to say those words, even though you know that it's probably happening to say those words out loud and, and to do it the way that he did. Um, I thought it was really well done, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things, as you can imagine, being talked about before they become public. Andrea? Dave, you just mentioned how much you love to finish, and you all were able to do that last season after your bye uh, and, and hit the reset. I'm just wondering how crucial this year's bye was, considering now you all know this is CJ's team uh, and, and being able to get the guys re focused, but also maybe understanding what he's been able to do well so far to put you in position to finish the way that you want. Yeah. You know, it's, it's similar and it's not from last year. Last year we were coming off of a pretty embarrassing loss uh, to Duke. And so the bye week was really a, a recalibration of a lot of things. We were going through the quarterback thing, as you know, which we don't need to rehash. And um, the team did a great job of buying into the changes we needed to make. And, and we put our, our best foot forward and caught some momentum and, you know, beat Clemson, beat Miami, got on a roll there um, behind, you know, the different things we were doing. And uh, this year it's more coming out of a, a win with back-to-back 300-yard -back games for a uh, young quarterback, and he's gaining confidence and momentum and timing. And so it's building on that and looking at the things that we've done with him, uh, areas that he's having success, areas where he's not, and, and not just him, the guys around him, you know, how can we – take advantage of the things we're doing well and 
what tendencies are on there that we need to fix. And, um, and then fundamentally, what can we do to help, you know, in protection, what can we do to help in the run game? But there's a lot more momentum going into this year's bye week than there was last year coming out of the game we had with Duke. And so that piece is different. I think, you know, you're hoping for the same results, which is a better football team coming out of the break. And, and we're definitely uh, in a better place health wise. Uh, and that was critical because we were it was slim. Um, it was really slim at, at one point during that game. I mean, there was some not just fatigue, but there were some pretty sore guys playing. And so they needed a break. Uh, Noah. Hey, Coach, you mentioned the bye week. What did you learn the most about this team after, you know, watching back the film and being able to, you know, take a week and spend on your own team this, this past week? Well, without giving away things, because, you know, we have to play a game, um, there's a lot of things you learn. Um, the big picture things, you know, we need to play better early in the game. Uh, we are a really good fourth quarter team when you look at us statistically, and, and we're not a really good first quarter team. And so, you know, being able to start the game better um, is something that sticks out statistically. Uh, when we take care of the football and, and do a good job on defense, getting it back, I mean, we're undefeated since 2020 when we win the turnover margin. And if you look at the games we've lost this year, it's a problem in those games. And so those two factors are really paramount, you know, in our improvement. I think special teams wise, you know, we've it's been a weird year. It's just been a lot of kicks in the end zone. Um, our kickoff return hasn't had a lot of opportunities. Our kickoff teams only had one kick back. And you look at what you need to get better at, you know, um, our punt coverage at times, Caden's been a huge weapon. And at times we haven't had the same success. And so being more consistent, I think in that area, um, I, I think, you know, looking at our place kicker, Kanoa from 40 and ends hundred percent knock on wood, you know, we've had him, uh, try some longer kicks and haven't had success there. It's an area that he can improve. You know, one of them's not on him. I you know, kicked a 52-yarder into the wind because it was fourth and 20. Normally, I'd have gone for it there. But uh, I like what he's doing, you know. It's uh, interesting when you see it because, like, even our punt return team, we've been in safe punt uh, almost a third of the time. Uh, and if you can get your punt block team on the field, you got a chance for returns. you got a chance to rush punts and – We've just had a lot more fourth and medium to shorts where you're, you know, you're worried about fakes from the other team. So that's an area that we're really looking at, you know, how we can gain an edge uh, in the special teams part of the game. Because, as you know, that's been a, a big factor for us over the years, being able to win games with that third of the game. Uh, and really the focus is individuals, you know, that have a lot of reps and how we can help them take another step. There's little things in each position and, and you look at the the offense and you start always up front, you know, what can we be better at at each position, left tackle, left guard, center, right guard, right tackle, tight end, and finding one little thing in each guy's game. We call it a one more here. But the thing Yeah, Coach, two questions. One, I know that this probably must, must be the billionth time you've had to talk about it or think about it, but does Grayson's decision to retire from football make you rethink concussions and football players and how they deal with safety and how the league deals with safety? And the second question is, have you had any kind of conversation with Grayson about his path to becoming a coach, whether he's sought you out for advice on where to start or if he has a place on this NC State team and now or in the future as a coach? Yeah, um, you know, part one of your question, you know, we take their their safety very, very seriously. And, you know, anytime there's um, any type of brain injury, concussion, they go through a rigorous protocol. Um and sometimes it's second and third opinion. Sometimes it's even going to the NFL to get advice. Our staff does a tremendous job medically uh, downstairs, Justin Smith and our team of docs. And, you know, those aren't our decisions coaches make. They're not. And uh, as far as him uh, as a coach, yeah, absolutely. I told him, like, if this is the path you want to be on, we're all in helping you. And obviously he's got our staff. He's got Coach Beck's staff. He's got Coach Chadwell staff. He knows a lot of coaches, you know, and so he's going to have opportunities in this profession if this is what he wants. And I think right now he's just kind of feeling things out. You know, I don't think it's 
good for anybody to make rush judgments when they don't need to. He's got time and I think he's just enjoying being around the team right now. He's still a captain. He's still leading. He's helping CJ and Lex in meetings at practice today. He was fantastic. You know, he's out there giving him advice, talking about what he sees and he loves the game of football. He loves the brotherhood of football and he's going to be really good. You know, if that's the, the path, it could be high school, could be college, who knows which direction he takes it. But I don't think there's a rush to that. You know, I mean, the guy just made an announcement. He's not playing anymore. You can give him some time to decide his future. Well, coach, uh, quick follow up. I mean, in terms of the safety, I meant more so about your opinion on do players, should players wear guardian caps or maybe some kind of extra, I mean, Obviously, football is a naturally violent sport, but there's really no way around it when you're, you know, you're a player and you're getting hit over and over again. So have you had any any extra thoughts about that now that Grayson's gone through this? Well, in his case, it wouldn't have mattered. You know, uh, the helmet came off. And so, yeah, I mean, I think those are things that need to be discussed in the offseason. Again, there's a, a lot of medical people that look at the safety, not just in the NFL, but at the college level and as coaches, we're going to do what they recommend. And we wear them in practice every day. Uh, if they think that's the best foot forward in, in college football, then, yeah, I would be 100% behind it. But, again, I'm not going to make medical decisions based off statistics that I don't have my hands on. And if that's the direction people want to take it, you're going to have full support from NC State. Rob? Yeah, Dave, you just played Cal. You're playing Stanford this week, obviously. And then I know Duke just played SMU. So you're scouting them, I probably would imagine as well. So having seen the three teams, I was just wondering if you have an opinion as to what type of value they're bringing to the ACC and the competitive level. And just – I think they all have a lot of enthusiasm for being in the league as well. Yeah, I mean, I watched uh, the Duke-SMU game live. That was a crazy game, all the turnovers and SMU – Certainly he's having a good season. You can see their value, uh, the way they're playing, and and uh, very explosive on offense. Um, you know, we just played Cal, and like I said, they have the number one defense in our league right now statistically. And so 17.1 points a game, I think, is what I saw today. It's pretty impressive. And um, I'll have a better feel for you on Stanford after we play them. But, you know, all three teams are good football teams. They're well coached. Um I have a lot of respect for their coaches, being around them. They're first-class guys. You know, they're very professional guys. They know the league, and um, they've been around the sport, you know. And, and I've known two of them um, longer than you – know, Troy's the one I've probably known the, the least amount of time who we're playing this week. But they're good coaches, great programs, good schools. I got to tell you, playing at Cal, it's, you know, getting there is one, one thing, but being there – it's a cool stadium, you know. It's cool to be in that environment, and our players really enjoyed, you know, being in the Bay and seeing all that, and it's a life experience for them. So I don't see anything but positives that way. Uh, Brian Pearl. Hey, Coach. Uh, apologize if I missed it at the beginning, but uh, I was wondering if you had any updates on Devin Boykin, uh, what is our timetable for return? Not yet. No, I mean, his recovery is going really well, and when he's ready to play, we'll – have him out there, but again, we're not going to rush him. And yeah, everything's been good downstairs. He's working hard and he's done a great job doing everything they've asked. Noah? Yeah, to follow up, um, before I think we got cut off, you know, how would you assess the run game to this point through the first eight games? It's, it seems like it's been up and down. Just what is your, your point of view on that after watching it through in the bye week? You know, it's interesting when you look at it. Um, we have three backs averaging over four yards a carry. Um, but when you look at our total run game numbers, they're not good because of the negative yards plays we've had with sacks and TFLs. And so, you know, it's inconsistent. Uh, it's not, not where we want it to be yet, but it's not a failure either. And I think you also get behind in a couple games where you stop running the football. And so we need to be better there. Uh, I'll also tell you that, you know, some of the, Throws that we're making are on run plays. And so, you know, that's a little bit misleading too when you're in an RPO system like we are at times. Um, there are handoffs to be made and the coverage is telling us to throw it and we're throwing it for completions. And so sometimes it looks like you're a more pass heavy offense than you are um, because the actual play call is a run with a pass and, and it can go the opposite really quick if you're defended in a different way. So, 
you know, we'll see how it goes. I think mean, you know, guys all know that I like the physicality of football. I, I do enjoy being able to be balanced and run the ball, and we're not there right now. We're not, and it's something we need to get better at. And then to quickly follow up on Grayson, you've talked about, you know, he'd make a great coach if, if that's the route he wants to go. What kind of traits, you know, did he have as a leader and as a teacher that would, you know, make him a good coach if that's the, the road he wants to go down? Well, he's a confident guy. He's very humble as well. He, he has a lot of humility. I think he has a lot of perspective. Um, you know, he was, you guys know his story, but, you know, really coming out of high school, wasn't very recruited and overlooked and, and kind of a self-made guy. Um, very decorated and plays the game hard, you know, plays really hard, prepares really hard. He really respects the game. Um, and when I say respects, I'm not just talking about the game itself, but what goes in behind the game, how hard you have to work and, and the way that the, the, the meeting should be, the, the preparation you should have at his position, the routine you need to have to prepare to win, um, the way that guys should practice around you uh, and, and, how that irritated him, you know, when a guy wasn't going full speed and he wanted him full speed and he would talk to him about that. There's just a level of standard of play, um, which coaches look for too. And, and that's where you could just see him as a player. You're like, this guy's going to be a good coach if that's what he wants. And um, I really appreciate how he treats people too, you know. I mean, you can just see him having interactions with guys, coaches from both sides of the ball, players from both sides of the ball. And, you know, if you walk in the team meeting room, he's always one of the first people there. You know, always. And he's just an impressive young man, man. He's one of those guys that you just really pull for. And so not that we're – I mean, I'm super excited about what's next for him. I mean, I think he's going to be elite. All right, last question, Brian Murphy. Thanks, Coach. Um, a little bit off topic, but I saw you guys have a series coming up with Kansas State, and I wondered about your scheduling philosophy, especially in the in the college football playoff era. Um, I know the ACC doesn't want you playing at, you know, group of five schools. So how difficult is it to to sort of come up with a schedule that's good enough, but also get you where you want to go? Yeah, I mean, scheduling is interesting because these games are scheduled so far out, you know, sometimes seven or eight years out even. And I, I don't know how you can do it right anymore because these conferences keep changing, you know, and. Uh, you sit there and you schedule a game and you wonder, is that league now going to force them to play more league games? And and now, you know, we've had some teams cancel on us in the SEC because they're, you know, potentially having to play more league games. Um, I like having uh, a competitive schedule. I also like having some games where I know I can get more players in the game, you know, and develop some youth and get some game experience for some guys and, you know, when you look at some of the teams that are, are ranked right now and, and you have some teams that are uh, six and seven wins and some of their strengths schedules aren't very good. Um, and then we played a really challenging schedule, as you know, and uh, early in the year. I think there's value um, to being undefeated. <laughs> I think there's also value, you know, like Clemson opened with Georgia and, and that's a tough opener, um, but it sure had got them ready for the rest of the season. They're playing really good football right now. So, you know, I think there's – you got to be smart about it. You don't want to put too much too soon because uh, you do need to play your roster early in the year. I think that's really important to get some of your backups meaningful reps. But you don't want it to be a cakewalk either. You want to be tested, and, and you want to play against some good players so you're ready for those higher-up conference games.